This episode is sponsored by Kendo UI. Kendo UI allows you to build better apps faster. They have a comprehensive library ranging from data grids and charts to buttons and sliders. Plus, you can use their components as plain JavaScript as well as in Angular, React, and Vue. They have a large collection of customizable popular themes like Bootstrap and Material. Go check them out at javascriptjabber.com slash kendoui. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of JavaScript Jabber. This week on our panel, we have Amy Knight. Hello from Nashville, Tennessee. Corey House. Hello from snowy Minneapolis. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. And this week, we have a special guest, and that is Greg Kushto. Greg, do you want to say hi? Hello, everyone. Do you want to give us just a brief introduction, who you are, what you do? Sure. My name is Greg Kushto. I'm the Vice President of Sales Engineering for Force 3, and I've been focused on computer security for the past 25 years. Right. And what, what we have you down for is thwarting insider threats, which seems like um, sort of a subclass of security threats. Yes, that's correct. Insider threat's really a passion of mine, and that's for a couple of different reasons. Uh, the first is that most people really think of insider threat as one specific example. Say somebody like Edward Snowden, who is a person who is on the inside, who got access to information and you know left the organization one way or another and spread that information. And that's certainly a great example of insider threat. But really today, insider threat can be defined as almost any threat that's coming into your organization. Uh, and that's because most uh, computer attacks are using uh, the either the employee themselves, the credentials from the employee, or something inside of a company to actually go ahead and commit that threat against the company. So insider threat started off as a really narrowly defined subset of threats, but today it really covers the majority of what people are seeing inside of their network. So when you're talking about insider threats, then you're talking about things like, like you said, like stealing credentials and stuff. But does that also include maybe um, knowledge of the systems that leaked out and things like that? It does. It would include knowing how systems work. It would include, I mean, it even includes things like leaving a couple USBs with malware in a company parking lot and waiting to see who is overcome with curiosity, picks one up and walks inside and plugs it into their computer. So that right there is defined as something as an insider threat. It's just a regular person who has no malicious intent. They just happen to park next to a USB drive and want to see what was on it. So insider threat really can cover the gamut from using people who don't even know what they're, that they're being used to people who are acting maliciously with inside knowledge or inside access. So we're web folks. So how, how does that apply to us as programmers? Sure. So that applies in a couple of different ways. First of all, insider threat is really about access to those systems and not only just the systems, but all of the applications that run on the top of those systems. You know, IT infrastructure people really like to think that we're IT, but at the end of the day, nobody really cares about the infrastructure, especially these days where you can literally buy <laughs> as much infrastructure as you want at the drop of a hat by clicking a button. Right, So it's about talking to people like yourselves who are actually creating, who are coding these applications, who are taking the actual data that we want to protect, doing things with it, and then sharing that data out to citizens, customers, different organizations. You all are who we need to start educating about computer security and why we care about it so much. Not that you don't know about it, but if we, we've spent so much time talking to the inside infrastructure people that we've never given everybody who actually is using the information, the attention that you guys really deserve. So are we talking about just using data in a irresponsible manner? Or are we talking about like losing data as well? Because um, I have a thought about the, the later there. It's the okay. Russians. That's what we're talking about. Well, that's certainly one example, but I would say there's a lot of different examples between uh, not only nation states, but cybercrime to anything from ransomware. You know, if you look at something like ransomware, where criminals are exploiting the very loose security based around serving up ads to web pages, compromising those so they can compromise end users, 
get access to those systems and lock them down for Bitcoin. I mean, to me, that's an insider threat. You're taking something that somebody else owns and making it act on your behalf. You know, the person whose laptop just got shut down and they can't access any of their data, they didn't have anything to do with that, but their equipment has acted against them. So I've realized it's a bit broader than the traditional, you know, people uh, with the ski mask on slinking down the hallway at midnight, uh, stereotypical, stereotypical view of people have the insider threat. But I do think changing that conversation to make people more aware of all the different entries uh, into losing your data, your information, uh, whatever you or your organization care about is critical. So kind of where I was going with that, I was going to bring up the really like controversial topic. I think, I don't know, it was like a year or so ago where there was this newer developer and he had like dropped the production database and some people were like, I think the company fired him or something. I think I could be getting that wrong. And I was just kind of wondering your thoughts, like, is it the organization's responsibility to have systems in place to prevent something like that happening? Or was it the junior developer's fault? Yeah, so to me, that's insider threat. That's a great example. And this is an example of somebody who was negligent. They didn't realize they were in prod. They dropped all the tables or whatever they did. And the organization didn't do any backup or anything like that. So, yeah, I mean, that's obviously an error on that employee's part. They really should have been more careful to know where they are. But if you're a company and you're just letting people go into prod and do whatever without some type of change control process without uh, documenting, I'm going to go into production, I'm going to make these changes, and then I need everybody to agree to this happening. And then you go forward, you execute those changes. A process like that would have saved everybody a lot of time and effort. So yeah, I mean, that's definitely something from an individual point of view. Wow, <laughs> you want to double check where you're sitting before you start issuing commands. But yeah, that's a great example of insider threat and how companies need to start thinking about, again, it's not just malicious people. This is somebody who just had the worst day possible of their entire career, probably, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I, for what it's worth, I feel like a lot of like new developers or just anybody in general, like you get to work your first day and you're like, I want to kick butt and I want to prove myself. <laughs> and then sometimes you end up making a mess. So, right. And, oh. you know, something I tell uh, anybody who's ever worked for me, all the customers I've ever had is that temporary solutions become permanent problems. And that was a temporary solution. We didn't have a or a whoever it was, they didn't have something in place to test what changes were going to be made to production and sign off on that. They didn't have a backup system in place to ensure that if something bad happened to the data, to the application, that they could quickly spin that back up. And so therefore, when something bad happened, there was no way to recover from it. So that's critical is to not only sit down and think about what somebody intent on doing something bad could do, but what somebody accidentally could do given the credentials or given the rights and the access that they have. So what do you do then? Take away the keys to the car? Well, I think one of the important things to do is realize they are keys to the car. You know, a lot of times, and I've been guilty of this myself, so I will raise my hand and throw myself in here. But a lot of times with people that have super user or admin or root or whatever one of rights you call them, they just use those as part of their life. They log into their laptop as administrator. And the next thing you know, they do something accidental and bad things happen. Or they're logged in with administrative privileges and they go to Starbucks and they get a drive-by ad. And the next thing you know, somebody's into their organization. So I don't think it's uh, taking away the keys of the car and as a punishment sense, but more making people realize, hey, when you're in this count or when you're using this privilege, you need to think about what you're doing, what the impact's going to be, and only use this when you need to use this. If I'm going to check my email, I don't need root access to check my email, right? I can just have a normal user account. So helping people figure out who has admin privileges, when should they use them, and how to quickly and easily, because if it's not quick and easy, people aren't going to do it, how to quickly and easily escalate and de-escalate from those privileges, you're going to continue to run into problems like that. It, it just seems like there are a lot of different ways that we could define or a lot of different types of these kinds of insider threats. And so it seems like there'd be a lot of different kinds of solutions. 
So are there, are there some overarching general principles that we need to consider then? Yeah, I would personally like to break things down into, into threes. So for me, three high level things that any organization, group, person, really anybody can sit down and do. The first of all, for the first one is figure out what exactly are you doing and documenting it. It's mm-hmm. everyone's least favorite thing. It's the eating your vegetables approach to IT. Nobody wants to do it. Um, Amy, I think it just mentioned, you know, you want to get in, you want to kick butt your first day, you know, documenting how the login script works is not what normally people think of as kicking butt the first day. So it's really about changing that, that expectation. Hey, documentation isn't a punishment that you have to do. Documentation is so that we know how the system works. We've thought through how data is going to flow from the network to a system, to an application, to a user. It's making sure that we can control all of those different points in which data is moving throughout your organization. Uh, The second piece is to figure out what data you have and how it needs to be protected. And part of the issue that organizations run into sometimes is they take whatever their most critical piece of data is and then try to protect every single piece of data in their network like that. And that is impossible. Not every piece of data inside your organization is mission critical. I have a ton of emails that I don't even remember I read because they weren't critical. They don't need to be treated as top secret. They don't need to be locked away in a vault. It's about figuring out what those specific data sets are that are mission critical, that your organization can't replicate or would be insanely time consuming to replicate or would lead to a loss of prestige or business or money or whatever motivates your organization, figuring out what those specific data sets are and protecting just those data sets. It's a great place to start. And then finally, the the last thing people need to be trained on is is we do, and this goes back to the taking the, the car keys away, you know, IT has always been, I used to call us the wild, wild west sheriff, right? We're sitting there watching the tumbleweeds go by and we really feel like we've got the badge and the hat and the six shooter and we're going to secure everything. And that's not today's world. It's not that easy. We don't have the keys to the kingdom anymore. So if you're constantly going to jump out and tell people, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, oh, you're not allowed to do this, people are going to go do that anyway. They're going to go spin (laughs) up an AWS instance. They're going to put data somewhere it shouldn't be, and they're going to say, oh, well, I put all my stuff on drop and on box anyway. So, oops, I guess I don't care anymore. And now you're in the newspaper because all of your organization's data is on box, right? So it's really about turning that security conversation from you've been bad, I'm going to punish you, or I'm going to make fun of you because you didn't do the right thing, and making it constructive. What, what is the organization trying to do? How can we make that secure? That's the conversation we need to have. And the same thing goes with users. We spend a, oh, don't click on this. Don't click on that. Oh, you can't go to this webpage, right? What are you trying to do? Why do you want to go here? And how do we protect you from yourselves? How do we know that you're going into the internet's a malicious, hostile environment? We know you're going into it. How do we best protect you and not just blame you for doing something anybody else would do? You know, one of the examples I use is, you know, we do some penetration testing and the number one most effective, absolutely free penetration test that I have found and is 100% effective is you get malware, you put in an Excel file, you name the Excel file senior executive salaries, and you email it to everybody in the company and you wait about five minutes and somebody opens that and you're inside of the company. And that's not something oh, wow. in magic away. Somebody somewhere is going to see an Excel file that says, you know, executive compensation, employee salaries. So somebody is going to click on that. It is human nature. You can't legislate that away. You can't train that away. So figuring out how to protect people from themselves is critical. So I know that was kind of long-winded for what's a quick high-level answer, but those are really the, the first three places I would start with. What can I do about insider threat? So the example you just gave strikes me as rather intractable. What what are practical things that you can do to keep people from clicking on a link that is so irresistibly 
curiosity inducing as that. I, I think that's exactly that's exactly how I would reframe that because you can't get people to stop clicking on that link. It's it's an impossible task, you know, unless you're going to do some kind of uh, clockwork orange, you know, tape people's eyes open and make them watch violent movies situation. You've you've got to change the game, and the game is how do I protect that application? How do I protect that environment, that computer? And how do I make sure that if somebody does accidentally click on that link and get compromised, that who's ever compromised that laptop can't move on to your internal systems, aren't going to be able to pull up a copy of your customer database from that laptop. So if you're looking at how you're going to secure people from making mistakes, as opposed to trying to stop them from ever making mistakes, you're going to have a much, much easier time for actually securing yourself. And you're going to gain the trust and the goodwill of the people who you want to do secure things. People by nature, I mean, we're social animals. We want, people want to do good. They want to work together. That's how human beings evolve. So, you know, it's not that people are maliciously going around clicking on bad things most of the time. It's just, they didn't know they should have done that. So being able to control that environment, minimize any damage that could happen from people accidentally doing that, is going to save you a lot of time. And guess what? If you're able to stop people from accidentally doing that, that's also going to be effective from slowing down people who are maliciously trying to do the same thing. Because all those same controls of sandboxing, of virtual environments, of making sure that data is kept in certain places and protected, all of that's going to be just as effective against malicious threats as it is accidental compromise. When you start a new project, typically you need things like a domain name, hosting, things like that. When I choose hosting, I pick mine for the options it gives. I like to know what I'm getting and set things up just how I like them. This is why for your projects, you should check out Linode. Linode servers feature native SSD storage, a 40 gigabyte network, and Intel E5 processors. That's all the power you need to run VMs under full control or Docker containers, who doesn't love that, encrypted disks, and VPNs. Plus, they have 10 data centers across the world and add-ons like Backups, Node Balancer, and Longview to help you control your server costs. They also offer block storage for your static files, and you can get started with a $20 credit if you use the code JavaScriptJabber2018. That credit is good for four months on their one gigabyte server. That's a lot of time to try them out and see if they're the right fit for you. That code, again, is JavaScriptJabber2018. Also, if you're interested in working for Linode, they're hiring. Head to linode.com careers to see their available positions. I also want to just talk briefly about, um, it sounds like if you have a process for things, you can avoid some of these issues. You know, you're talking about uh, the, the production data, dro- dropping the production database and things like that. And, um, you know, if you know how the deploys work, you know how to, you know, you do the change control stuff, which having worked in both ops and dev, <laughs> that's still such a pain. But at least then you know where people are at and what they're doing, Right. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, for for us, too, I, mean, I spent a, a half my career in operations. So I know that, too. To me, one of my first questions before I make a change in production is, hey, we've got a backup of this, right? Just in case something horrible happens. <laughs> because I've been in that situation, too, where something horrible happens and you're scrambling. So, you've, you know, as a company, it's in your own best interest or in an organization, it's your own best interest to make sure there's process procedures and backups and again all that vegetable stuff in place but as an employee it's just it's just as much in your self-interest as well right i need to figure out that if i'm making mistake or if i run into an issue that this people aren't going to be pointing at me oh that's the guy that dropped all the data from the database yeah that was me but guess what before i did that i had everybody else sign off on this is what i was going to do and we made sure there's a backup in place so you know, this is, we're all in this together. How can we move forward solving this? So again, trust me, I understand that it's definitely not the fun, exciting part of either, you know, IT infrastructure or operations or application development, but it's one of those things that really makes everyone better off when they're doing it. So then how do I start to identify some of the areas where I'm most likely to have problems? Um, For example... I, I don't know. I, I tend to have a blind spot until something actually happens. And I'd like to catch it before it happens. So how do you, how do you proactively 
saying, oh, this this is likely to be an issue and this other thing is likely not to be an issue? I mean, do you send phishing attacks to your developers? Or So I think doing secure tests and development is certainly one way to catch uh, a lot of issues before they happen, right? If you're trying to replicate as much testing as you can and grins to your environment, you're definitely going to see what works, what doesn't work, how you can jump in, um, how you can fix things before they actually happen in production out in real life. That's definitely one good way to do it. You know, another way, good way to do it is a good old-fashioned mind map, whether you're using software or you're sitting down at a whiteboard. All right, let's talk through the system, how it works. We start here. The We're going to send this data over here. Well, wait a minute. How do we start with the data? Oh, well, it's on Frank's computer. All right, well, right there, you know there's an issue. So mm-hmm. just me- just mentally and out loud, walking through how you see data flowing, how you see an application working correctly is a great start as well. And then, honestly, I mean, a lot of the mistakes that I've personally, maybe this is just me, I feel like a lot of the mistakes I've been a part of, I had a sense that that was going to be an issue or it had happened before or I thought the night before, wait a minute, is this going to work? Or, you know, I was in a meeting saying, I don't know if this is the right thing to do, everybody. So really being vocal when you do have, for lack of a better word, your intuition, your spidey sense, whatever you want to call it, goes off. You know, wait a minute, everybody. I have a really bad feeling this isn't going to work correctly. Can we just step through this one more time before I make this change in production? Because I just don't, you know, I want to make sure that this is going to work the way that we think it does. I think it's just being more vocal about about how how you see the process working and ensuring it's going to work correctly. It just makes me think of Han Solo. I've got a bad feeling about this. You know, I've been staring at your Han Solo carbonite behind you, which is why I said that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's true, right? And I think there's also some element you're talking about, you know, going back over what you're going to do and just creating a space where it's okay to not know the answer. I think is really important, especially for new people. I mean, Amy's example, she said junior developer. I know senior developers, by the way, who have dropped the production database. So, uh, you know, nobody feels special because it happens. But yeah, you know, it's just going over it again. How do I do this? How do I migrate the database? Or how do I make the changes that I need to make in production? You know, how do I follow the process? And that way, everybody kind of understands where things are going because it's much more important to be correct than it is to be the smart guy. Yeah, I can't like pile on that enough. It is really important that there's a safe space to speak up because without that, you know, somebody told me once, you know, just because I was new at the time that, you know, I should speak up because a lot of times when you come in with like a completely different mindset, you potentially are going to pinpoint things that other people might gloss over. So you know, no matter where you are in your process, you totally should speak up and, you know, hopefully you're in an environment where it's safe to do that. I completely agree. And especially new people. I mean, when you're coming into a brand new place with things you've never looked at before, that's the perfect time to sit down with somebody and say, hey, let me explain how all of this works to you because you're not living this day to day. You haven't been in 17 meetings about this. You're going to say, wait a minute, why do you do that? Or nobody, you know, we just, we just do. Why? And that's the perfect time to ask somebody, does this look like it makes sense? Where do you think we could do this differently? Or, you know, when you, when I explain things to people, you know, I'll be honest, a lot of the, a lot of the time before I talk to people, I talk to my wife, I talk to my parents, my family, and I try to explain what I want people to understand for computer security, because my wife's a teacher, my dad's an accountant, my mother's in health insurance. If I can get them to understand a complicated security topic, then I know I have a good shot of trying to convince other people about why I'm so passionate about it. I guess too, like not just new people, but like new as in, you know, they haven't been programming a long time, but just new to the company. I feel like a lot of times you will have someone start off at a company and they have all these ideas of things that they want to do. Um, or, you know, as they're getting onboarded, you know, holes in the process of that onboarding as they are being given credentials and stuff like that. And, um, You know, I think more often than not, we are in a rush to get our work done. And if they poke holes in something, you know, other team members will be like, yeah, we've just done this forever. Uh, You know, just keep doing it this way. And I think at that point, you do need to stop and 
evaluate or log a ticket to evaluate soon the process. Yeah, I agree. And and again, when you're when you're fresh and somebody's explaining something to you, that's just so much more opportunity for you to I mean, it's not that somebody is wrong. It's just there's always different ways to do things that may or may not be more successful. And, you know, we're making the easier and easier we make IT look to everybody not in IT. We all know the more and more complex it's really getting behind the scenes to give that impression. So especially these days when you're talking about not even virtualization, which, you know, containerization, and there's not even a VM anymore. And it's completely different from what people understand. Now's the time to really sit down and make sure that you, you understand or you have a good team of people who can help you understand all these concepts, because it's just getting more and more complex. Yeah, one other thing that I just want to add to this conversation. So um, last week, I, I flew out to Denver and I gave a talk about automating code. And the first part was about the tools that allow you to automate different parts of your programming practice. And, you know, part of that is is some of the things that we talked about, you know, here with like deployments and, you know, certain routine tasks that you have in production and things like that. But we talked about a whole bunch of other stuff. The second part was the processes. And I find that all of these things that we're talking about here, they not only serve to make your system more predictable and less chance that you're going to create a situation and it makes a lot of the important things routine, but it also gets a lot of that stuff out of the way so that people can do their job. And because people feel empowered either by the tools or the technologies or the processes or the environment that you create and all of these things that kind of go together, um, it solves the other problem that we're seeing a lot more in uh, the development world these days in that it's easier to onboard people if you have these processes. It's easier to... Um, offboard people. I mean, if you're letting people go or people are leaving, it makes it easier to have those processes in place, but it also makes it a better place to work and it's easier to retain developers. And so there's the payoff there as well. If you've got really senior people and you're taking the steps to make sure that all of these things are in place so that everybody knows what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to do it, and then they can just focus on solving the hard problems, which let's face it, we're programmers. That's what we do. And that's what we like to do. Uh, And I don't want to have to worry about whether or not you know, Docker was set up the right way and blah, 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 right? I just want to run the script and have it go off to production wherever that is. If we have all of these things in place, then I get to like my job more. And so all of the things that we're talking about, it it solves that retention problem as much as it solves the security problem. Yeah, I, I agree. And it allows you, you know, the thing about eating your vegetables before dessert is that it was it works, right? If If everybody just grew up eating dessert and having fun and going off and solving hard problems and not doing all the steps necessary to create a framework for success, then you're going to run into a lot of issues. So it's one of those things where, okay, it's going to take me an extra 10 minutes in my day to document what I've done or to explain the changes I've made to somebody else for them to sign off before I put this in production. But at the end of the day, if it turns out you catch an error, you're catching hours, if not days of cleanup for all of the bad things that came out of you not understanding that process or there being a system change that you weren't aware of. So it's it's one of those things where it it's a little bit harder up front, but it makes your life so much easier in the long run that it's just you've got to be willing to invest that little bit of time up front just to make everything else better. Yep. And nobody wants to work for that company where when something goes wrong, well, somebody's getting fired. You know, we, we all want it to be a place where it's safe to learn. Just don't drop the production database without a backup. And the, the, but the point there too is, is so somebody drops the production database, we, we should be having the conversation where it's in the postmortem, okay, well, A, you know, lowly developers should not have access to drop the database or maybe even to drop, drop tables. Right? And the other part of the conversation could be, um, how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? And then, and then we have the conversation and say, we need to back up our database. Yeah, and that's a great example of why it's so critical to make sure that you're helping, because you're not just helping the company, you're not just helping a person, you're helping everybody out. You're making everybody's jobs easier. You know, and information security, the same way. It's, you know, people are like, oh, well, that's just going to make the security better. Yeah, it is, but 
It's going to make our environment much more secure. It's going to eliminate a lot of issues. It's going to make your job easier. You're going to know the environment's more secure. You can trust some of the controls that your application is riding on top of. So it's really about, again, going back to not not just standing in front of people and saying, you've been bad, you have to do this, or, hey, this is really boring work, but if you get it done, you can do something fun. It's about getting everybody to understand that if you have that mentality, if you're doing things the right way, if you're helping people stay secure, then they're generally going to do that and they're going to come to you when there's issues as opposed to you getting a phone call from your boss or worse, a reporter or somebody else out in the field asking why all your corporate data you know, is on the dark web. So how do you have that conversation then, especially if theoretically somebody could be to blame? Because you want, you want, you want all the information, right? You don't want somebody to feel like they have to hide things or, you know, well, I might lose my job if I talk about this. So I'm just not going to tell anybody that I changed the root password on the server and I don't want to change it back or something. Yeah. And again, that's a round of the automation and orchestration like you talked about for coding. It's the same thing for secure coding as it is for developing secure infrastructure. Anytime you leave human beings in charge of something, there's going to be a certain amount of error. That's why it's called human error. I mean, it just It just is. We're not infallible, right? So you've got to figure out how can you automate um, your tasks on a daily basis, whether that's coding, whether that's spinning up and down uh, different environments, whether that's uh, moving, adding, deleting, changing infrastructure, or even you know moving, adding, changing users and access rights. The more of that you're able to automate, you're able to test, and then you're able to repeat uh, from a computer, the less of that human error you're going to run into. And the easier you're going to make everybody's job. At most places, you know, walking in the the time between you walking in the door and you having access to all the systems you need to have access to is greater than zero. It should be zero. It you HR should put in you, your job duties, your system access. They should click a button and the infrastructure should be able to figure out what access you need. However, I think we've all experienced it's days to sometimes weeks before, oh, wait, I don't have access to the system. Oh, you got to go talk to this guy over here. You got to talk to this person over there, and then they can get you access to that special system. If you're able to automate those types of menial process, you're not only going to remove the error, you're going to provide a better job experience and a more secure environment. Yeah. My other question is, is how do you approach the postmortem? So you have an event, right? You get that call from the reporter. Or, you know, somebody emails you ransoming your company's data. You know, you so see, you get it solved, then what? How do you post mortem so it doesn't happen again? Yeah, so post mortem is crit- critical in any security um, incident. Easy for me to say. So the important part is to sit down and coldly and dispassionately figure out what happened, how did it happen, how could we have prevented this? And what are the specific steps that we could do to prevent this in the future? Now, everybody always wants to rush to who's the person who I can point at or put in the news or let go or do something so I can say, hi, fix the problem. And yeah, you're going to fix that specific problem that that person may have done, but you're going to have somebody else commit some other kind of human error again in the future. And you're not going to have solved any type of systematic problem or programmatic issues that you could have if you had removed who did what and figured out how can we prevent this from happening again. And the going back to that example, you know, the developer that was able to drop all that information in production, it's almost like, well, look, let's not even worry about that. How is production designed? Why don't we have backups? How come there's not security controls? Let's solve all of those issues. Somebody being in the wrong system and issuing the wrong command could have happened to anybody. So if you let that person go, okay, you've stopped that person from having a bad day again, but you haven't stopped anyone else in the organization from having a similar bad day and leading to all of this, uh, leading to a similar outcome. So for a postmortem, it's critical that you figure out not only what happened and who did it, 
And again, the who did, it's really not that important. To me, the most important part is how are you going to stop this from happening again in the future? And then putting those steps in place to make sure you are preventing that from happening again in the future. So it's not just, oh, hey, it would be great if we had a backup system. All right, let's go to lunch, everybody. It's okay. How do we find the funding for that? How, what kind of backup system are we going to provide? How are we going to install that? And then what kind of replication are we going to have? How far to date are we going to be if a situation like this happens again? So it's really critical to figure out how to make sure that incident or incidents like it don't happen again in the future. That's the most critical part. Then come out of any postmortem. Finger pointing is not doing anybody any good except creating a culture of, uh uh-oh, I don't ever want to say anything because I don't want somebody to point at me and things to be my fault. I know, Amy, you have to leave soon. Do do we want to keep going and just have Amy give her picks now and we'll splice them in? Or do we want to just do picks? I think I'm ready for picks. All right. Um, Greg, is there anything that you want to add before we go to picks? Yeah, the only only thing I would like to add is just, you know, I, I used to spend a lot of time educating people and trying to get them to understand why security is so important. I find that's not an issue anymore, right? We all know why security is so important. We all give free credit monitoring multiple times a year, if not more frequently, and why information security is critical to everybody. I think the important part is for if people just take that extra step to think through what they're doing, either professionally, in their personal life, before they commit to something, I think that's going to make us all a lot more secure. And I think that's going to lead us to better IT future for all of us. Yeah, it makes sense. And yeah, I, I think I think to your point, you know, we, we all think is my data out there? And the answer is almost assuredly yes. I mean, these huge companies, Equifax is the one I'm thinking of, you know, so, so we all have to be paying attention anyway. So let's make sure that it's not our company and us that's the next big breach. Exactly. All right, let's go ahead and do some picks. Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Uh, Amy, do you want to start us off with picks? I do. So actually, um, this is something really cool that I think my friend is doing. Here and there, people have reached out to me asking for help because they want to submit proposals to conferences and stuff like that. And I've done workshops on this for people. But he had a really good idea. So there's all these like awesome whatever lists on GitHub. And so he's starting one for awesome proposals. And there's only a couple up there now. So I'm going to share a link to his GitHub account for this. And so if you have proposals, that you've worked on and you feel comfortable sharing them so that other people can take a look at what has been successful for you. I think it would be really, really helpful for the community uh, for people who want to get into speaking. So that is going to be my pick for today. Awesome. Corey, what are your picks? Uh, So I have a couple picks. Uh, One is a a tool called Plop, which isn't new, but is strangely new to me. I hadn't uh, seen it before. And what it is, is a handy way to create files on the command line. So you can come up with a Uh, format that your team likes to use for whatever technology that you're in. And then they just uh, have a command line that says plop and then whatever uh, prompts that you want to give somebody. So in that way, you can uh, enforce consistency on your team and also speed development uh, by generating files in exactly the format that you want, with the imports that you want, whatever conventions you want to uh, input. 
Other thing was, I was lucky enough last week to have my uh, Mac uh, crash on me where it wouldn't boot. So I reinstalled Mac OS and then realized that I had lost all my fun VS Code plugins. I was very sad and I had to try to remember them and go through my Twitter history. Uh, but then I found a uh, VS Code Sync plugin that syncs all your VS Code settings out to a GitHub gist. So this will not happen to me again. Uh, so I will share that in the show notes. Two thumbs up. Uh, those are my picks. Awesome. Um, I'm going to throw out some picks. Uh, the first one I have is haveibeenpwned.com. And that's a website by Troy Hunt. Um, he's he's a, just a super security guy. We've had him on the show before. Um, he also has a bunch of security courses on Pluralsight, uh, devchat.tv slash Pluralsight. Um, if you want, we, we get a cut if you go through that. But either way, go sign up for Pluralsight. Um, so yeah, really... It's just nice. You can put in an email address and you can see if that email address is listed in any of these compromises that are out there. So um, anyway, he's got all kinds of hacks and has just pulled all that information in. So anyway, uh, that is one uh, pick. And the other pick I have, uh, this will come out around the same time as our first Elixir podcast. So if you are interested in Elixir, which is a functional programming language, um, then uh, definitely check that out. Um, I know that it's probably of more interest to the Ruby podcast crew just because a lot of the Ruby community has moved toward Elixir. But I know a bunch of people here really like functional programming and it's just a really, really cool functional language. So um, I'll put that out. It's elixirmix.com and uh, you can go and suggest topics and all that good stuff. We're going to start recording next week. And then uh, the last thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell folks about some of the conferences I'm going to be at over the next few weeks. So next week as we record this is ng-conf. Um, so it's probably going to be over before you listen to this. But if, if I, I don't remember if this goes out next week or the week after. So if it's next week, then come find me at ng-conf if you listen to this before it's over. And if not, then I'm sorry I missed you. Um, after that, I am going to microconf in Las Vegas. So if you're in Las Vegas, let me know and I will see if I can uh, connect with you before I come back. Um, I'm flying back on Wednesday. Uh, the, what is it? The third? The second. Then I'm going to be at Ruby Hack in Salt Lake City on May 3rd and 4th. And then I'll be at Microsoft Build May 7th through 9th. So um, anyway, so if you're in Las Vegas, Seattle or Salt Lake, um, I'd love to connect. So just uh, ping me, chuck at devchat.tv. Uh, Greg, do you have some picks for us? Sure. The one thing I recommend to everybody, it's about five to seven minutes a day. Um, Sands puts out a daily information security podcast. It's called the Stormcast. They go through um, what hot issues are for the day. They go through uh, vulnerability discovered in different software. Uh, and it's really a quick, easy way to stay 95% up to date with information security that takes almost no time. So I'd recommend everybody, you can, if you're listening to this, you're definitely listening to podcasts. And again, it's five to seven minutes and you'll be more up to date than most people in the security community. That's a good tip. Uh, AJ, you have any picks for us? Okay, you know what? I've got, um, there's a pancake recipe that I found that makes delicious, delicious, delicious pancakes. Um, the, the recipe is called Fluffy Pancakes, but I modified it slightly. I used rice vinegar instead of white vinegar to, quote, sour the milk. And it gives it a distinctly sweet flavor that's really good. Um, but I'll give a link to, to my modified version of the recipe and the recipe itself. Um, and... What else would I pick? Um, I've started listening to this book called The Mind and the Brain. It talks about neuroplasticity. And basically, it sounds like it, the guy that's writing it is the guy that discovered that the brain can be changed by the thoughts that you have. So he posits that there's a distinction between the mind and the brain. So the mind might be either, you know, could be considered the soul of the quantum realm or I don't know. He's, he gets really technical about it, but basically he's, he's positing that there is a non-material something that works in the brain and that can actually cause the brain circuitry to change and to overcome things like 
uh, OCD or other disabilities that are typically characterized as brain circuitry disabilities. Cool. All right, Greg, uh, one more question. If people want to follow you online, uh, Twitter, blog, GitHub, anything like that, where do they go? Yeah, so my Twitter is uh, G Kushto. So you can follow me there. I uh, tweet a lot of things about security as well as about sports team. And uh, I'm a big home brewer, so there may be some home brewing tweets in there as well. Uh, and then if you go to my company, if you go to force3.com slash blog, uh, I have a blog there. You can follow my thoughts and uh, some of the conferences I'm going to speak at. Awesome. All right. Well, let's go ahead and wrap this one up. Thanks for coming, Greg. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. We will uh, catch everyone next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.